Hey everybody, I'm back again. It's been a little bit over a month, which I don't like doing to you, but, and I don't like doing to me because I enjoy filming these videos, but sometimes life gets really busy. And in this case, I just got back from a five day trip to Ocean City, Maryland, where I taught at Salty Yarns. They had their jamboree and it was such a great time. But before I talk about that, today, as I'm filming this, it's October 17, 2018, and fall has come to my part of Oregon in full swing. I thought I would film down here with this lovely vine maple behind me. We don't have a lot of color in our forests in the autumn, um, because we're primarily a forest of conifers. We have a lot of Douglas fir and western red cedar and we have hemlock and they're all evergreen. Um, there's a lot of holly in the forest, again an evergreen. But punctuated throughout we have a lot of the vine maple and we have big leaf maple which are amazing super impressive and they're just starting to turn so I don't have any of their leaves to show you but those maple leaves are not kidding you gigantic which is why they're called big leaf maple um, a lot of fun when those leaves come <laughs> dropping down all around you and land like a giant pancake on your head um, speaking of leaves turning colors though do you like fall as much as me? Good, because, yay! <laughs> now I have leaves in my hair. I just had to do that. I don't know why. Feeling frisky, I guess. I did have the foresight to cover my coffee, though. Speaking of which, I had a lovely surprise waiting for me in the mail a couple days ago. And it's perfect timing because this is the time of year when in our part of the world we close up the hive for the last time for the winter. Honeybees don't hibernate, but um, they are physically not able to fly unless it's a certain temperature outside. Around here it's generally around 50 degrees outside before I see my bees taking flight and leaving the hive. If it's colder than that, they just cluster up in a ball and they're able to keep the queen and the brood that overwinter in the hive or that they're rearing. They have a small amount of babies that they rear during the winter and they just cluster up and they're able to keep a constant 80 to 90 degree temperature in the middle of that cluster, but they don't venture out of the hive um, because they just physiologically that's not how they're created. Every once in a while you'll get a nice warm day um, and it'll reach that around 50 degree mark and you will see bees leaving the hive to have what they call cleansing flights because they just hold their waist in and they don't because they don't um, defecate in the hive they will actually, on those warm days, they'll, you'll see bees flying out and they cleanse themselves and then they fly back in. Um, anyway, this is my first year overwintering. Um, if you followed my beekeeping story at all, you'll know that my honeybees absconded last September, meaning 100% of them, well, probably 99% of them just up and left. They decided it was not a fit place to live. We had wildfire smoke and heat all at the same time. So I'm, it's a little bit nerve wracking getting ready for my bees to overwinter this year, but everything looks great in the hive. There's a nice, exactly what you should expect to see this time of year in Oregon, in my part of the, Oregon at least. I, was that, has, was that been there that whole time? Oh my gosh, why didn't you guys tell me? Now I'm all distracted. Anyway, um, getting my bees all battened down yesterday and it was just sad. It's the last time I get to really, you can briefly open the hive if you're concerned. 
Um, if you think your bees need some supplemental feeding at some point in the winter, you can just lift the lid fast enough to slip some food in there. But it really causes undue stress to them to open the hive in the winter. So anyway, I started that all by showing you this mug that came. And this will be what I hold on to all winter long when I can't go spend time with my bees. I am going to get a stethoscope though because you can you can listen to your bees in the winter time and see if they I don't know I don't know how you know if they're healthy or not but I guess if you can hear them then you've got bees and they're alive and that's the point. I, some people have infrared sensors I guess and they can see how big their winter cluster is which is pretty darn cool. Um, maybe I'll put that on my Christmas list because that would be super fun to go out and be able to spy on my bees without opening the hive. Anyway, that's not why you came today. You are not watching my video to listen to airplanes fly over. It is a lovely day for a flight, I suppose, if you're a pilot and have a small plane. And I'm sure you also did not come to listen to me ramble on about honeybees. So what am I going to talk to you about today? Um, let's see. A couple things. Oh, the trip to Maryland. I did something new this time. So I don't know about you, but when I fly, my feet and ankles tend to swell. And I know it's a normal side effect of air travel and sometimes it does it worse than others and on my return flight from Chicago probably partly due to the Chicago hot dog I had for lunch which had probably a week's worth of sodium in it my feet and ankles swelled so bad on that flight I was so uncomfortable. I had to unbuckle the straps on my sandals and I just, I thought my feet were gonna blow up. So, I went to my old BFF Amazon and I got myself some compression socks. Not just any compression socks, these are toeless. So that I could wear them with sandals if I wanted. I didn't, because it was chilly here in Oregon when I left at 3.30 in the morning. Um, I also don't, I don't know, I like my toes to be free. So they are toeless and they're sheer. They're not black like they show on the cover. Oh, they look more like, like those right there. I'm telling you, they don't feel, I thought they would be uncomfortably tight. And they, they weren't. They were actually rather comfortable and I had zero swelling all the way across the country and all the way back. And we're talking about Pacific Coast to Atlantic Coast flights. They were great. If you haven't tried it, if you, next time you're going on an airplane trip, go to Amazon and look, these are true form. And they have all different varieties. You can get ones with toes, you can get ones without toes, you can get ones with patterns, you can get sheer, you can get opaque. There's a ton of them out there. I just randomly chose one and the fact that they were toeless, you know, that was kind of the clincher for me. Um, they were great. I am going to be wearing compression socks every time I fly from now on. Something else, if you're a fan of Beats, these are super good. I actually picked them up here in Oregon before I left on my trip trying to find something healthy to have in my snack bag. And I happen to love roasted beets. I hate pickled beets. I'm sorry if you like them. Um, but these are really good. They're they're not fried. They're they're dried and they're crunchy little bit salty not too much they just taste like a crunchy beet and um, four grams of protein so when you're stuck on an airplane and you just don't have good food options these were really good the brownies that I bought at the grocery store 
They were supposed to be like healthy brownies. I thought that they would taste good. They tasted like healthy chocolate flavored grossness. I won't even tell you what brand they were because I probably should. Open Nature? I think they were Open Nature. Don't get them. They weren't good. Very disappointing. I really wanted some chocolate and I didn't get it. Um, oh, something else that I'm really into right now. Okay, so I graduated from high school in the early 90s. Um, and at that time, you know, grunge was the big thing. And I had friends who had Doc Martin boots. I could not afford them. I had some knockoff Doc Martens. That, you know, it just wasn't the same, but it was all I could afford. And by the time I had, was earning an income and could afford to pay $100 or more on a pair of boots, they were not in fashion and I know I still would see people wearing them from time to time but in my line of work I was working in an office I just didn't have a practical place to wear them so I did buy myself a pair of red Doc Martin lace-up boots but they were my work boots and I mostly wear them out in the forest or hiking sometimes I'll wear them to town but they're pretty beat up because I've I've worked them. Uh, they still have a good 30 years left in them because they're built to last. But I have in the last couple years been on the search for some black boots and I don't know why I didn't think about Doc Martens. And a few weeks ago I was out shopping and I see these cute high school girls, trendy as they come, and one of them was wearing Doc Martin boots and I'm like, could it be? Are they back in fashion again? I don't care. Even if it's just that one girl, I am going to get me some boots. So I've ordered, again on Amazon, because we don't have good local shoe stores around here, and with how busy my life is and homeschooling my kids, I can't make it into the city very often for a real, like, I'm going to find me some boots shopping trip. And the couple times I have gone in the last few years, it's all like, you know, pleather and I can tell these are going to fall apart after, you know, a couple months of wear. I want something made to last. So, yes, let's see how flexible I am. I got me, finally, all of these years later, my first pair of real boots. and. They said that they would be hard to break in. They lied. They are so comfortable. The only thing I don't like about them is it takes me two minutes to unlace and lace them back up again. First world problems. Two minutes to lace up my boots is really not a big deal. And I just end up keeping them on my feet all day because it's still dry enough there. I'm not coming in the house with muddy shoes at this point. So anyway. What else was I gonna tell you about? Um, oh, this is exciting. I have my very own line of needle nannies. You guys know about these? Zappy Dots makes um, needle minders that are so strong. I'm shedding hairs everywhere. These things are so strong, they will hold a pair of scissors. So, not just for your needles. So, check this out. They're awesome. They're so great. If you have a pacemaker, you're not supposed to have these close to your pacemaker because, I don't know, they can do bad things to it. So, for a couple years now, I've thought it would be really fun to have my designs on um, some needle nannies by Zappy Dots and I tried reaching out and contacting them but they're busy they make needle nannies and they they do a lot of other things they have a line of jewelry where you can pop your magnet into this jewelry and you kind of swap out your necklace design which is really cool I went with just the plain old needle nannies I don't think they fit into their jewelry I could be wrong um, 
So I hadn't heard back from them for a long time. And then when I was in Chicago in July at the Tomorrow's Heirlooms retreat, Pam and Kim said, how come you don't have any Zappy Dot, you know, line of anything, needle nannies or whatever? And I said, well, honestly, I've, I've looked into it, but it's been hard to get in contact with them. And they said, we're going to talk to them because we do business with them. I no sooner got home, it was like maybe the next day I had an email from the company saying, hey, we've been meaning to contact you. Thanks for being patient. Can we collaborate? The rest is history. So I have 18 titles. And um, if you're a shop owner, you have to go straight to Zappy Dots to order them. I don't wholesale them. I only have them um, available retail. But through, if you go to my Etsy, there's 18 of them. I have all of my current Alphabet series because they're round, so they fit really well. Um, Coffee Quaker, Baby It's Cold Outside, His Eye is on the Sparrow. I chose the ones that tend to be the top sellers of my designs. And then moving forward from time to time, I'll come out with some new ones. So, I don't know. I don't use... I don't use needle minders on my stitching because I stitch in hand, but I have needle minders all over my house. I have one on the side of my lamp that's next to where I stitch, and it holds my needles right there. And then I have one that holds my little um, needle threader, and I have one that holds my scissors, and then on my filing cabinet upstairs, I probably have 50 um, non-standard magnets because they're needle minders. I just use them as magnets. And then they're on my refrigerator. So needle minders are great. If you don't use them for needle minders, you can use them for a magnet. So that's exciting. Um, while we're talking about my shop, I added a new feature and you'll have to give me feedback on this if this is something you would use or um, you know, maybe somebody will give it a try and let me know how it goes. But I went through my Etsy shop, I mail my patterns, um, first class mail. I just use a paper envelope. It keeps the cost of shipping down for you and it's, it's easy and convenient. It's not a lot of extra packaging that seems unnecessary to me for just a chart. And I've never had any problems with charts, people telling me their charts are damaged or they're unhappy with the first class mail. But it seems like in the last few months, especially with international shipments, there have been a lot of severely delayed or even entirely lost orders. I think the only ones that have been entirely lost were international shipments. So I decided to keep my shipping low cost like I've had it. It's a flat 99 cents for the first item and then 49 cents for any item after that for charts. And that covers the bare minimum of my postage and I don't know, driving to the post office, it's, it's not much. Um, I, I only recently, I wanna say in the last year and a half even started charging postage and it's because the prices have gone up so much. I for years and years didn't charge shipping <clears throat> and it just got to the point where I really needed to um, to help cover my overhead. So I added another, I've added a listing in my Etsy and it's basically for upgraded postage so I should have brought an example down here but I didn't think about it. Instead of a uh, standard paper envelope your charts would come in a padded envelope and then it would be that extra layer of postage which includes tracking again primarily for international shipments I think is where the benefit could be most seen so anyway if inquiring if inquiring minds want to know I now have that feature um, Let's talk about the retreat, just a few stories about going to Maryland. So first of all, traveling 
from Oregon to the East Coast. It's an entire day's event. So my flight left Portland airport at 6.30 in the morning. So my goal is always to leave my house three hours before my flight takes off. And that gives me time for that time of day, there's no traffic. So it's like a 45 minute drive, 50 minute to the air park. Um, and then I, the air park shuttle over to the airport and then get through security. And then I usually have time to grab a coffee and sit for 10 or 15 minutes, sometimes a half an hour before it's time to board. But it's early in the morning and a little too early for breakfast. But I've been feeling pretty run down just getting ready and my life has been extremely busy, having a hard time staying on top of everything. So I went ahead and took my handful of vitamins and I thought, oh, I might regret taking vitamins without food. So I grabbed a banana out of the fruit bowl. And as I'm driving out the driveway, I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to leave this banana peel in my car because then my, my car is going to smell like bananas when I get back home five days from now. It was supposed to be warm and sunny while I was gone. And I thought, well, I'll just eat it real quick. And w I live in the forest and it's a banana peel. It's going to decompose. So I eat my banana. I'm still on backcountry roads. I, in the dark, reach over push the button to roll down the window and then I take my banana peel and I huck it across the car because that's the closest to the trees and I just hear this boom pew, like it hit my window and fell down and I just I immediately started just laughing out loud to the point where I'm like I'm gonna run off the road because I realized I had rolled down the back window and not the front window. So I just laughed and laughed. I reached over because I thought maybe it was on the seat. It wasn't on the seat. So by the time I get into Portland, I, I've forgotten already because I'm so tired. So it wasn't until the day after I got home. By the way, when I got in my car, it did not smell like bananas, so it didn't trigger any memories. I ran into town and I had my daughter with me and I opened that passenger door to put a box in the car and I just started laughing because here on the running board is this crumpled up banana peel. And sure enough, once I like remembered the story and I told her and she's laughing and I'm laughing and I look over and on that window there's like this very distinct impression of a banana peel on my window. I might not wash it off for a while because it's just a reminder to not take yourself too seriously. I certainly don't have that problem. So in order to fly into the ocean, the closest airport to Ocean City, I think is Salisbury Airport maybe. That sounds slightly right. Um, it was either going to be a red eye flight or like 15 to 17 hours of traveling and really expensive like three times the price of what I'm used to paying to fly across the country and none of the options just seemed pleasant in the first place let alone paying that much money now the shop reimburses me for my travel usually when I go and so I'm trying to look for a good deal for the shop too as well as keep myself comfortable as possible so I typically fly southwest so I decided I did some research and I decided that flying flying into the Norfolk Airport um, which is in the Virginia Beach area and then it's a little less than a three-hour drive up the coast well I like road trips that kind of thing it's right up my alley and it would only be 10 hours of traveling as opposed to 15 and I think um, you know the airfare was like 600 and another 200 or so for the car rental and gas on top of that was ex it was quite a bit cheaper than it would have been just for the airfare the other way so 
that's what I did. So Wednesday morning last week, get up at oh dark 30, flight leaves Portland at 6.30 in the morning. I was on the ground in Virginia by five. And then I um, had the lovely opportunity of meeting up with Donna Ray and her husband Tom and having some dinner. And then I drove up to Ocean City in the dark on quiet highways with hardly any cars. I didn't turn the radio on. Hi, kitty kitty. Do you hear me talking down here? You gonna come say hi? I wonder if he'll come all the way over here. He'll never let me pick him up, so I doubt you're gonna see him. No, he's just gonna wander by. So, I had heard about the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and tunnels, but I didn't hadn't really registered any of the information I heard about it. So here I am driving in the dark and I'm just letting Google tell me where to go. And I know that I've entered a toll bridge and I know that it's a relatively long bridge, but holy cow, I just kept driving and driving and driving and driving and driving and driving and I'm still on a bridge and oh, here's a tunnel that's one lane going each way and here comes a big truck and I'm like, yeah, have you seen the movie The Holiday? And Cameron Diaz is driving in Great Britain, in England, you know, and she's like, ee! you know, on the road. That's what I felt like. I felt like doing a Cameron Diaz squeal. I didn't. Um, and then I'm back up and I'm driving and driving and driving and driving. And then there's another tunnel. And um, the first time I had a chance to talk to my kids, I gave them a homework assignment. I said, okay, I want you to look up this tunnel and tell me how long is it? 23 miles. 23 miles. That you're not on ground. You're on a bridge. And then you're under. You're above the bay and you're under the bay. And you're above the bay and you're under the bay. That kind of stuff doesn't scare me. Um, but it's impressive. So... I need to do a little more reading up on it because I want to know how it was done, how it was engineered, how long did it take to build. Some of you people may know, if you live in that area and you've never gone across the bridge, you really should do it. It's amazing. And I did notice when I was coming back down the coast on Sunday after the retreat, at the end of the bridge on the Virginia Beach side, it, you can do a U-turn. So you could, I don't know how much the toll cost because I got a little automatic digital reader. Um, you could potentially pay the toll once and you could drive, you know, one way and then do a U-turn and drive it again the other way just to experience the whole thing. It was amazing. Anyway, I got to the hotel the Lankford Hotel is owned by um, the family that owns Salty Yarns. They own the hotel, they own um, the shop, and a few other shops as well. The hotel was, they're fourth generation family owned. And the hotel was built in, I think, 1923 or 1924 by the first generation. And it's such a great little hotel. It's very historic. If you like old architecture, um, it had the old wooden five panel doors and, um, you know, some of the, the plumbing pipes, you know, were running on the inside of the wall, on the outside of the wall instead of the inside of the walls. Really clean, really comfortable. Um, it smelled like an old building, but I like that smell, so that didn't bother me. Um, and some places more so than others probably just also because of being right on the beach. It's literally facing the boardwalk. So they gave me a room on the front of the building. And so in the morning, I didn't even have to get out of my room to watch the sunrise over the ocean. It was just right there. If you ever have a chance to go visit Salty Yarns, book a room at the Langford. You really won't regret it. It was a great experience. And the boardwalk was so nice because it wasn't crowded. I would not go there in the summertime because I don't like lots of crowds. Okay, I don't know where I was at when 
my camera stopped recording. But anyway, all I can say is good things about this retreat. There were 60 attendees. The shop is really large and really packed. There were charts in there that I didn't know existed. Part of that is because I primarily stitch my own stuff. And if I buy other people's charts, it's my it goes into my someday folder. This is my retirement folder. So when I decide that I'm not going to design anymore, these are the things that I want to have on hand to stitch someday. Um, but it was just amazing to walk through and all of the linen and the threads and the charts, anything you could possibly want, they have it there. And um, the whole experience was really great. So I can't speak highly enough of this particular retreat. There were three designers. Um, the purple thread was there and, oh no, I'm going to get in trouble. There was a needlepoint designer there and I the name of her business is escaping me we didn't interact at all um, I did spend a little bit of time with Sharon uh, the designer of the purple thread mostly because we've we knew who each other were we're actually on the same floor every year at the Nashville needlework market so it was the first time we'd had a chance to really talk with each other I also met um, Patty who's the designer for samplers revisited and again, she's somebody I was aware of, but hadn't really ever had a chance to get to know. So that was fun to meet a few other designers. And the stitchers there were amazing. I met some re very remarkable women. And anyway, I'll stop making you jealous. <laughs> but retreats are so worth it. You may have to save up. Some of them are shockingly expensive. But let me tell you... The, you're going to get your money's worth out of no matter how much you spend. If it's a less expensive retreat, if it's really high, if you have to save up for three years, the experience is worth it because you are surrounded by people who speak your language. We, we all know needlework. And this one was interesting for me because the three designers that were there were relatively varied in style. We don't have a lot of similarities. Other than that, we love to stitch. And so the attendees at the retreat, they got a nice variety of projects to work on. Speaking of projects, do you want to see the one I took? Okay, now before I show this to you, this will be released as a pattern to the public at some point in the future. I don't know when yet. Um, there's a chance I might teach this at another retreat before I release it. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I will never have a fully exclusive design. Um, I will have a design that I create for a club and maybe I modify it slightly before I release it to the public. But once I invest that much time and energy into a design, I want it to eventually be available to everybody. And likewise, I don't ever retire my designs. They're all 100% still available and I just print to order once I get to a point where I've run out of my you know initial stock I am able to just print one at a time at home and it means that I can keep a lot of designs available um, I understand the designers that retire designs because printing them it's inconvenient and you know there's there's a lot of different strategies but anyway all that to say, this is not available yet. This is not a new release. This is not something you can get your hands on anytime soon. But I'm really proud of this project. And the thing that was great was that going into this retreat, I didn't know how the classes were gonna go. I didn't know how many I would have in a class or how long the classes were. And I was really pleasantly happy that I ended up with 20 people per class and there were it was a three hour class and everyone who had their pre-stitching homework done before the retreat, they finished their project. There may have been a couple that were almost finished at the end of class and then they maybe went back to their room and finished it later. But 
I had pictures of 46 completed projects at the end of the weekend and that just made me happy and it made a lot of people happy. I didn't necessarily make them happy ahead of time because I made them stitch on 40 count and um, through lack of experience because I've never kitted a pre-stitch before there was some running out of threads issues so I apologized profusely to the stitchers and I learned so moving forward any of my pre-stitching kits hopefully will be much more generously supplied anyway this is pins and orts and the inspiration is my messy rat's nest of orts next to my stitching area I've had various different open bowls which I really liked that I would put my little thread ends in but Inevitably, I would end up putting my chapstick in there or scissors and then when it's time to throw out my orts, I'm digging out the things that I want to keep. It's a little more messy looking when people come over and I thought, what if I had a covered dish of some sort? And I found these tins um, at HobbyLobby.com and I think they it seems to me they retail for like seven or eight dollars um, which is really nothing and it's just it's just a metal tin holds a lot of orts and then I designed this little pin cushion top lid um, I designed it so it wouldn't slide off and then there's just batting in there and um, the glass hopper made these counting pins for me in uh, little mismatched sets of this kind of rusty and the purple and so those came in the kits and then there's a little needle berry that goes with it I like to put my needles in a little strawberry because they're easier to find you know if I push them in too hard and then the final little add-on to this kit was the little, I had a little special pins and orts needle minder made. So it's an entire companion that holds your trimmings, your pins, your needles, and your scissors. And it sits next to your stitching area and keeps things happy. So that's the project I taught. It was a lot of work. And... Uh, People seemed really happy with it at the end, at least to my face they were happy. So I told them, any kind of feedback you have, send me an email. And I haven't heard from anybody, so either they hated it so much they're not going to tell me, or they've already forgotten, or maybe they're still jet lagged. Um, I did meet Deb and Liz, I think on Floss Tube they're country stitchers. I haven't watched them yet on Floss Tube, but I'm going to have to now because they were both lovely ladies. And they had already figured out that this little stitched piece was going to be a strawberry. So they came prepared with little metal caps. And they sent me home with a couple of them. Wasn't that nice? So... I'm not sure if I'm going to add this to this project for future iterations, like if I teach it again, maybe provide these in the kit, or if I'm just going to keep it for myself. We'll see. But they they both put the little, this is um, Lady Dot Creates cotton lace that's just drawn into a circle and attached. So they both put the lace on and then added their little metal cap on top, and I thought that was a nice touch. So, thank you. Oh no, the afternoon, I'm still jet lagged, just hit me. I could use a nap right now. So I am gonna show you, oh, <laughs> I got my ear pierced while I was there. <laughs> well, it's not really as extreme as it sounds. I got it pierced in a place that was previously pierced when I was 18 years old. But I went through a period of time when my babies were little that I just never wore earrings and I had the second hole in this ear closed up. And I was too chicken to just push an earring through it. I know I could have done it, but I would push and it would hurt and I would, it was just too chicken. 
so I was walking on the boardwalk on, I don't know, the day before the retreat started. And I kept seeing piercings, piercings, henna tattoos, t-shirts, more piercings. And I thought, I've been meaning to do this for like two or three years, get it re-pierced. And there's no one in my little town that does piercings. And to drive in to the next town over, you know, it's a good half a day. You make sure you do some other stuff while you're in there. And it's just not a priority. So it's always stayed low on the list of things to do. And here I am, no children, no meals to cook, no laundry to do. I'm just, it's just me walking the boardwalk. And most of these places looked pretty sketchy. Like, I don't know that I even wanted to buy a t-shirt from them, let alone get my ear pierced. You know, I just don't know what that whole situation is going to be like. So I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I think I probably won't. And then I passed a jewelry store that was a nice, clean, normal-looking, well-lit, a couple of middle-aged, smiling ladies working in there. And they had a little sign in the door that said... We do ear piercings in choir within. So I went in and I had my ear pierced. So now my my second hole is reopened. And it was nothing. I totally could have done it at home. Like I felt the moment that it went through, but she probably didn't even need to use the gun. She just needed to have the guts that I didn't have to do it. So, you know, she gave me the standard don't take the earring out for six weeks, turn it every day and keep it disinfected. And it's, you know, like I can tell it's already, it's already healed. There's, there's no soreness, no nothing. I mean, after two minutes, I kind of forgot that it was in there. So anyway, that's my story. <laughs> I went back and I told Sarah who runs the salty yarn shop and she's like, you're kidding. You are crazy. And I'm like, well, I'm really not that crazy. I just had a hole reopened. I'm like, now if I had gone and found a tattoo parlor and got a tattoo, that would be crazy. Not that I have anything against tattoos. I have a few of them and I have more that I want, but I wouldn't just do it on a whim like that. TMI, I know. So, um, I did some shopping while I was at Salty Yarn, so I thought I'd show you a few things. I don't do this very often, but um, I did buy a few things. I got a little Salty Yarn scissor sheath as a memory reminder, and everything I, almost everything I got, it's bee related. Surprise, surprise, honeybees. So I found these Dovo scissors, and they are honeybee striped. Can you? I don't know. Is the lighting okay? It was perfect when I started and now I'm getting the dappled light on my hair. How many more leaves do I have in my hair? <sighs> anyway, I couldn't resist those. Um, this tape measure, it's called Be Measured by the Purple Thread. It was the last one they had in the shop and I'm pretty sure she doesn't have any more of this kit. So I'm sorry if you see this and feel like you have to have it. You can always contact her. It's possible she has more, but it's just a really simple like honeycomb. It's all straight stitches, but it comes with the tape measure and the ribbon. It comes with everything to make, including that, that little B button that goes on your, the end of your tape measure. I'm actually going to make this. Most of these designs, I'm going to look at and drool over, but not stitch them. But this one, I could see throwing this in my bag when I travel and having just an easy something to work on on the road when I don't want to work on my models. Um, I also picked up a little needle threader that looks like a honeybee, but I forgot to bring it down here, and it's by um, Puffin and Company and it was just really sweet. It has a little magnet on the back, not super strong, so I swapped it out with a magnet that I already had that was really strong, so that's a good one. Um, 
I've never bought any of Diane Grick's um, patterns, but I saw this one. She's um, Silver Creek Samplers. I met her at Nashville a couple years ago. She's really nice. Um, and I, I don't like stitching letters, but it's a really nice verse, and I might stitch it. It says, guard me from all evil things under the shadow of your wings, and that's from Psalm 17, 8. Um, but what really caught me is I love this bird. I love birds, and I love her colors and the crown. I like everything about it. It actually, I think, will be a nice companion to, um, I have one of Lindy's stitches with the two birds on it. Oh, Stephanie, I'm sorry, I can't remember what it's called. It's one she came out with um, in the last few months. And I could see, like, I'm starting to envision, like, a bird wall that's all these amazing birds that other stitchers have designed. Are you seeing it? Yeah, me too. But then all of the other walls in my house will be bees because that seems to be what I'm buying lately. So I've seen this around for a while. It's hands-on design Buzz. It's one of her block party pieces and it's got a hive and a bee and it's a it comes with the wool patch that goes on the top for the pin cushion. My first hands-on design pattern. Because I look and I drool and I don't buy, but I did this time. This one I got off of Etsy. Um, I've been meaning to make some of my own project bags and I just haven't done it yet. And I liked the idea of this pattern because it's got the vinyl. I, it's, all, it's essential to me that my bags have vinyl because I like to be able to see what's inside. But then it also has this little patchwork piecing along the bottom, which I like. And I like that it has a handle, in theory. Once I make one up, I'll let you know what I think. But um, this is Patterns by Annie. And she's on Etsy. And she, uh, all of my interactions with her were super positive. And that's all I can tell you. I haven't tried the pattern. I haven't even opened it. so. I'm not sure how that will go, but I'll let you know. Um, I picked up Winter Cometh by Summer House Stitchworks, the other Beth designer, um, because I like it. I can't show you the back because that's where the chart is. I didn't get that at Salty Yarns, but I got it recently. Oh, I was ordering some fabric online, and this jumped in my cart, too. And then there's a man in the Ocean City area that goes into the, the Salty Yarns from time to time with these hand-carved, I don't know his name, it says RS09. So in 09, he made this little ruler. Can you see that? With the little B on the end. I don't know what in the world, you know, how often do I use a little three inch ruler? But you know, it's it's for, it's like using in place of a corner gauge, you would measure in from the sides of your fabric and for where you start your stitches. So even if I don't actually use it, I'm gonna put it where I can look at it because I love it. And then finally, I got a Dames of the Needle finger work um, pattern to make mostly because I love this little this little B skep scissor holder that's on there. The other stuff is adorable too. I like the little pin square. Um, I don't know at this point in my life I don't see myself actually making the little drawstring bag but um, I do see myself at some point making the little scissor pouch. You never know. When I'm retired, maybe I won't have any money to buy any new patterns and I'll just be able to stitch all the patterns that I already have. Maybe what I'll do when I'm retired is I'll have the money for the materials to buy to go with the patterns that I already have. Or maybe the zombie apocalypse will come and there will be no more new patterns, so there will be no temptation to buy 
and I will just be happy stitching the ones that I have at home because we will just live here and put up big fences and the zombies won't come and we'll be able to live off the land. That's the plan. <laughs> okay, so I think I just have a couple more things. I wanted to show you an antique sampler that I have. This is Scottish, I think, based on colors and composition. And this is not your wealthy Scottish girl's sampler. It is as primitive and rough as they come. The linen is like really coarse and has, you know, large holes. It's stitched with wool and it is falling apart all over the place. I actually, it's, I mean, it's lost threads. Somebody's tried to patch it in a couple places. It's not even framed very well. But I saw, where did I buy this? I bought it off of Craigslist in a lot of samplers. And just love it to pieces. It's just so ragamuffin. And there's like these random little, like what is, what is this right here? I don't know. And then down here, there's just like a single little eyelet pulled like really open. So years ago, I don't know how long, I charted it as is with all of the missing stitches. And it's actually on my blog as a free chart. Um, if you navigate, I think if you do a search on my blog for free charts, then they'll all pop up. And when you click on them, there's a link over to, I have a WordPress blog that's not where I post, but it's where I host my documents. And it'll take you right to a PDF to download this for free. Um, because I, it's so wonky that I didn't want to sell it that way. I just wanted to, I wanted to give it to the stitchers of the world. Um, and it's one of those things where you could probably easily figure out where the missing stitches should go, but I charted it with the missing stitches. And I know at least one person has sent me a picture of their finish with the missing stitches. But then what I did is I used that antique as an inspiration for my Christmas band sampler. So um, the alphabets and colors are similar. Um, but what I did then is I added a fun, like, sort of a thistle border, but poinsettia colors, poinsettia colors. And then it has some of the little wonky weird markings that the antique has. But I added Christmas trees on the corners, and then I have it say, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And then down here you have all of the numbers so that you can customize it. Um, I used the, the smaller alphabet for my initials and then I used the numbers down here for the year. I stitched that in 2012. Um, there's some, there's some eyelet down here, the new ha Merry Christmas and Happy New Year eyelet. And then this alphabet is, it's all cross stitched. It's just that each block of the letter uses four cross stitches instead of one, so it makes it bigger. Anyway, this is called Christmas Band Sampler, and it's been out since 2012. Um, I haven't updated the chart cover yet, so it's still my old chart style. Um, but that's going to be what I'm putting up for adoption through this video, is a couple copies of Christmas Band Sampler. So, um, use the words Christmas Band Sampler in your comment. Don't use the word giveaway. Um, you could say, I would like to adopt the Christmas Band Sampler, or I would like to stitch the Christmas Band Sampler, something to that effect. And um, on my next video, I will let you know who gets that. And I'll try to do my next video 
by early, early on in November. So then you could potentially, if you adopted this chart, um, it actually stitched up really quick for me. What did I stitch it on? It's on 28 count. So, I mean, you can see if you were to stitch it on a higher count, you know, it would be a lot smaller. Um, it's only 120 by 295. So it's, it's not giant. And you could even, you could leave off the numbers at the bottom if you didn't like that. I basically added those because I wanted to use this antique frame without cutting it down and there was a little bit too much and so I thought well I'll just stitch the numbers right on to there. Anyway, let me know if that's something that you would be interested in adopting into your home. And speaking of adoptions, I know that in my last video I showed Anna's prayer and a lot of people said I would love to adopt Anna and I forgot before I came down here today to draw some names. So I'm not going to announce who gets to adopt this chart, um, but what I will do is when I'm done filming I'll go back and I'll do my random, I go to, I use random.org and I just enter all of the numbers. Each person has a number. Anyway, I will contact you by um, commenting on your comment and then hopefully you will see that. Um, and usually by the next video, if I haven't heard from you, then it's, I figure you don't want it. Um, but I will, if I haven't heard from you by the next video, I'll actually announce names and try again. Is that all I have to talk about? Um, no, it's not. <laughs> the main reason of my video is to show you my new stuff. Now, usually I film the video and post it. I am really overdue for a haircut. Look how long it's getting. I like it, but it needs to be reshaped a bit. Um, so I usually will show my new releases a couple days ahead of listing them in my Etsy shop, but with traveling, I didn't tell you that part of the story. I was awake for 22 hours on my travel home day. I haven't done that since I was in college. I was so tired and it's still, I'm getting back to Oregon time, but it just, it's been a slow process. So I woke up at 6.30 a.m. on Sunday morning on the East Coast and I didn't fall asleep until 1.30 a.m. Monday morning on the West Coast. That's 22 hours. Took me a while to figure it out because I was tired and I was like, okay, the three hour time difference, you know, trying to figure it out. That was a long day and it felt like three different days because I woke up in the morning and I taught my final class at the retreat. It was a three hour class. Packed up, drove three hours back down to Virginia. I went to the lovely Norfolk um, Botanical Gardens with Donna Ray and her husband Tom. We, it was like an hour was the window of time I had. Beautiful gardens. I hope to go back again and see the whole thing. We just saw a small section of it. And then traveled home and it was a four hour flight, an hour layover, a three hour flight. It was just, it felt like such a, such a disjointed and weird day. Anyway, I don't know why I brought that up. My new releases, I can't show you the actual models because they are currently still on the East Coast. So I will just show you the covers. Um, the first one I have is called Mistletoe, Tinsel, and Jingles. And I got this idea last Christmas when I was going through my decorations. And I just, I have favorite decorations. I love tinsel. When I was a kid, we actually put this tinsel on the tree one strand at a time and would take it off carefully one strand at a time. And my mom had a very specific way of storing them so they didn't get crinkled and knotted. So I don't decorate with actual tinsel. 
Um, I do have a package of tinsel that I inherited from my friend Martha when she passed away, but um, I do use the tinsel garland. So I thought it would be fun to design a special storage box for the tinsel. And then I thought, how fun would it be to divide it and have jingle bells in one side and tinsel garland in the other side? So that's what I did. So it's the same basic concept as the boxes I did for the Tomorrow's Heirlooms retreat, where the design is meant to be padded and to go on the lid. It's a very simple process of mounting it on the lid. The difference with the tinsel and jingle bells one is I also made a fabric covered divider that's glued in there. So it's, you know, you've got two sections for storing your stuff. And I trimmed it with tinsel garland around the outside. Can you see that in the picture? And I, I just looped around with a thread and stitched on some little rusty jingle bells. I love how it turned out. You can't see the jingle bells super well on the cover, but they're there. And then I had another paper mache box that was narrower and taller, and I thought, I need a box for my mistletoe. Mistletoe is my other favorite Christmas thing because kissing my husband is fun. So I designed this one to add on, and the the color that ties them together because really you know you've got kind of brassy and silver tones in this one and then you've got the bluish greens and white in this one so I used black for the lettering to tie them together so I don't have a tutorial out yet but I'm going to hopefully in the next week film a video tutorial of assembly I'm gonna make another box so you can see my process of gluing on the fabric and attaching um, a motif to the lid. Um, so watch for that. Go ahead and if you're interested in the, it's real, it's simple. It's glue and paintbrush and cutting. And if you've ever done a drawstring method where you gather a circular design around a flat piece, it's it's not it's not difficult. It's just a running stitch and you gently pull and you've got one layer of padding in there and then it's just glued on and then I even glued the trim on. I don't generally advocate using a lot of glue in my finishes but in this case it's the perfect application for that. So anyway if you're at all in the, in the mind of doing it Go ahead and order the chart through my Etsy, through your local needlework shop, and then get your stitching going. And by the time you're done with your stitching, I should have a tutorial up for you to finish your box. This is something that really, you could have one or both of them done easily by Christmas. Um, because they're, they're relatively quick stitches. Um, and then the other one is my 10th in my Festive Little Fob series and it's Christmas. So we have a couple of motifs that are poinsettias. Poinsettias. I never know how to say that word because everybody says it differently. Poinsettias. Um, we have a little reindeer. We have a little feather tree with candles on the branches. And this is another style of Christmas tree on this motif and it's got colored little balls on it. We have a nativity, and I had to put blue jeans on Joseph. Just seemed like the right thing to do. Um, a little holly wreath. And my model stitcher stitched over one the word joy in there using the alphabet that comes with the set. You could put your initials, you could put a year, you could leave it open. I have a little wreath made out of bells, and I know you all love cardinals. So I included a cardinal. We don't have cardinals in Oregon. So it's really only Christmassy to me because I know that cardinals are associated with Christmas and snow and that sort of thing. So one of these days I would like to see a cardinal in real life, not in just pictures, but I like how he turned out. I think he's pretty cute. And um, he looks festive and he's holding a little golden star in his beak. There's only two more in the FOB series left. I can't believe it's almost over. It seems like it's been forever. All of the finishing of the little FOBs. 
um, I'm pretty proud of that project. I didn't, I didn't know how it was going to go, and you all seem to like them a lot, and I have done, I have finished a lot of tiny little fobs, and it'll be fun when I'm completely done with the series to have a big bowl of fobs. Um, so there are two more left. And at this point, those are the only two designs I have left coming out this year. So November will be number 11, December will be number 12, and then um, I've got all kinds of fun stuff coming up for you next year. I'm a planner. I have a spreadsheet. I love Excel, and I've got... I'm ready to be done with the smalls. I've got some actual samplers again that'll be coming out next year. Um, I have, oh, look what I got at Goodwill. Aren't those cute? My new readers. They're sort of Harry Potter-ish without being completely Harry Potter-ish. Um, so I'm just going to tell you what this one is that I'm working on. This will be released at Nashville and which is in March. It's a follow-up to my dog sampler. I have the dog sampler and it has a quote about um, has a quote about dogs. And I decided I've been thinking for a few years now that I need to design a cat sampler. So it's gonna have the same footprint. It's gonna be very similar in that it's gonna have a large house on it. Um, so the two, if you like both dogs and cats, will be nice companion pieces to hang next to each other. Um, these are, whoop, these are the colors. Um, a mixture of Weeks, Gentle Art, and Classic Color Works, because that's how I roll. And there's my start. That's all you get to see. Um, I am stitching it on 30 count. I used to stitch on the lower counts a lot. And I have moved more towards higher counts because I just like them better. But I wanted this one, I wanted my models to be the same size. And I stitched that original one on 30 count, the dog sampler. So you are welcome to stitch it on whatever count you want. I think it would be amazing on 40 count. Or 52 count or over one on whatever. I'm doing something else that I've never done before. I'm just, I designed a Biscornu. So I was getting ready to go teach at the Tomorrow's Heirlooms retreat in July and I wanted, I was too far along on a couple of other designs that I didn't want to I didn't want to show people yet. I it was it was going to reveal too much. I like to keep things sort of under wraps and just give hints. So I wanted to design something new. And I had been looking at some Biscornus, and I it's just mysterious to me how they're put together, but I know that I can figure it out. And so I looked up a tutorial, and I was like, oh, I can totally do that. I need to design a Biscornu. So I. The day before I left for Chicago, I designed a Biscornu and pulled all the materials. And so the ladies that were there, any of them that asked, so what are you working on, Beth? Got to see the chart and the colors and the thread. And I am now, I keep setting it aside to work on other stuff and then picking it back up again. But I'm going to show you the back side of it. It's very exciting. I love the colors. I love how it's turning out. So this will be the top and this will be the back. It's very colorful. Um, I'm stitching it on 40 count Stars Hollow by R&R. And it has um, classic color works and gentle art threads because those were the ones that in that, <laughs> that really quick designing period and packing and leaving those they were the ones that grabbed my attention and so that's what I'm sticking with I I've been using a lot of weeks dye works lately because I love their colors and um, 
that was part of the reason why I went with the other two of my favorite thread dyers because I wanted to share the love. I've used 100% weeks in the whole fob series and I thought I need to I need to use some of my classic color works and gentle art threads. So anyway, I'm excited for this one. This is also most likely going to be a Nashville release. So if you've ever been curious about Biscornus, um, I'm bringing them back, or at least I'm going to design one and see how it goes. Um, and I'm I'm trying to just with with the pins and orts. I'm trying to stretch myself. So I've never done anything that was this densely designed with a border. I usually, my borders are usually more sparse. And so to design a, an entire wreath of flowers was really fun. And I purposely used colors. Most of these colors are colors that I've never used before. I just was looking at my storage, um, my stock of threads and thinking, why have I never used that one? Why have I never used that one? I'm sure that you've noticed that designers tend to have a color palette that's kind of theirs. And I do, I have my trademark colors. I, my favorite greens are um, Weeks Oscar and Gentle Arts Endive. And I have my favorite blues and my favorite reds and they're just the browns that I use and they're all kind of the same that I use over and over again. So I'm trying to, I've been designing, my designs have been distributed for 10 years now. And I don't want to just keep doing the same thing over and over again. I'm, I don't want to completely remake myself. It's, it still needs to be me and what I like. And what I like hasn't changed. I'm just trying to stretch myself in different ways and to grow as a designer. And I can see that as I look back at my early stuff and my progression of my designs along the way. I can see how I've... I've changed, but I'm still true to me. I hope that makes sense. So I am i don't want you to always look at my designs and go, oh, okay, well, I can tell that's another of Beth's designs. It looks just like the last one. I want there to be some newness in anything that I put out. So um, keep me on my toes and you know, if you have ideas, if you're like, Beth, how come you've never done, you know, one of these? I, people asked me for mermaids for years, and I just never did anything nautical until, I guess it was last year I did Emma's for Mermaid, and then I designed the seaside fobs, and they're some of the favorite things that I've designed now. Who knew? So, if there's something that you would like to see me design, put it in the comments, or send me an email and just say, hey, have you ever thought about this? I do have, um, I have a wedding sampler that I've charted that will probably come out in the next year. I have, um, not designed yet, but kind of in my mind, I want a, um, not a, not a wedding sampler, but like a, a house sampler, like to commemorate a special house in your life or your current house that you live in. Um, where you could actually put in a photograph of the house. Um, I have a whole series of sort of heritage type samplers. I have four that in honor of my each of my great one and each of my great grandmothers and their photographs are in there. And I want to kind of play with that whole um, similar line. And so that's what the wedding sampler will be where you could put a photo in there and then I want to do the house one. And um, I don't know, I just have lots of ideas new things, stuff that I've never done, but then also revisiting old stuff and, um, you know, maybe continuing some of those series. I have at least three more in the coffee series that are ideas, not charted yet. And um, I don't know, at this point, I have at least three years worth of ideas in front of me. So I'll keep going. You keep supporting me and I will keep going. So anyway, talk back to me through the comments, through email, because I love to hear from you. And uh, I hope you're well. And if you don't have, do you hear the chipmunk? I think I'm getting lectured.
no, it stopped. Anyway, um, I hope you're enjoying your fall and if you don't have colors where you're at, just drink in the colors that I have back here. I've been posting some fall pictures in my Instagram too. I know depending on where you live, you may or may not get the vibrant colors. Um, maybe um, in a, probably in another week, we're gonna hit prime colors where I live. And as long as it's not raining, I will get some, maybe I'll get some video footage to put on my next video. Until then, I hope that you're well and stitching all the things that make you happy. And remember to share kindness wherever you go. Bye-bye.